This bird right here is the only animal in the entire Amazon that actually has the capability of cracking open that palm nut to be able to eat that seed. So without these guys, those seeds aren't actually going to be dispersed and spread throughout the Amazon in order to grow other trees of that kind. So how is he able to do that? Well, one thing I'm gonna show you is that he has 1,600 pounds of bite pressure. So he has the largest bite pressure out of any of the macaws, and it is so that they can actually go in and crack that palm nut open. So I'm gonna show you guys what we can do with a Brazil nut real quick. This is his first presentation in a little while since we are just kind of starting our presentation season. But, Mr. Akira, can you show everybody your wings? Okay. So I'm not sure if anybody knows um, how hard it is to crack open a Brazil nut. Yes. It's very, very difficult. He does it with ease. He can crack it open in just a couple seconds there. One thing I can talk about also while he's up here on his tree perch is you notice that he is blue. Blue in nature is a very rare color and typically it's pigmented and has some sort of um, mechanism to use as defense. So for example, the blue tongue skink throws that blue tongue out and basically scares predators away. Many times if you see blue in a frog, that is gonna indicate that that frog is poisonous to eat. Akira is actually very special. He has a very, very special blue. And that is because he actually does not have pigment in his feather that makes his feather blue. If we were to take his feather and put it under a microscope and examine it at the microscopic level, you'll actually notice that his feather um, is shaped very differently. So there's the feather, there's the barb, there's the barbules. And what happens is his feathers are shaped so that way they reflect, refract the light in a very specific way that gives off this blue color. Um, so one thing that, that's important to know about is that these guys have vision that is very different from our own. We are actually not capable of seeing UV light. These guys are capable of seeing UV light. So if you're gonna look at a big line of highs and macaws in a tree, you're gonna see a lot of blue birds. Um, but when they look at a big line of highs and macaws in a tree, they're gonna see very differently than what we see. And those feathers are gonna reflect, refract differently. They're able to look at individuals and they can um, almost distinguish between males and females because on certain sexes, the um, blue that we see on their wings is gonna actually show up as like a light violet or dark purple, depending on the individual or sex of the bird. Um, so I think that's something that's super, super cool about these guys. One thing you might notice too, is that he has these yellow phalanges up here on the side of his face. That is indicative of a macaw. So if you see a green wing macaw, a blue and gold macaw, you'll notice they don't have these feathers right here. So he has a, um, a lot of feathers that actually cover his macaw mask. Um, and that is something that is indicative of macaws. That is why that you always see macaws have this macaw mask. They have these little angies on the side of their face. Um, in a blue and gold macaw or a scarlet macaw, they actually have lines of very light feathers and they use those lines to communicate. So if a um, macaw is very, very stimulated, you might see those lines just really pop up and pop. Um, on him, occasionally you will see his um, yellow actually change colors and get like a deeper, darker yellow. Um, so I think that's also a really fun fact about them. Um, I can talk about his feet for a second. Kieran? lots of choice and control here at, in, um, at Turtleback Zoo. So like I said, this is one of his first presentations. It's very large in a while. So we're still kind of getting prepped up for our presentation season. So he chose to let me know, you know what? No, there's a lot of people. I don't know if I'm comfortable flying in front of all these people right now. And he asked to step up. You notice he put his leg up and basically was communicating with me. Hey, I'd like to step up instead. Um, some fun things about Akuri, and I'm, 
He probably won't do it today for the same reason he didn't fly, but he does have a very large vocabulary. So um, as you've seen him in his exhibit from last summer, he loves to say, I love you. He loves to say, hello. He loves to say, um, can you say, hi? Bad one more time. Can you say, hi? <laughs> so he's telling me he's excited, he's putting his wings out, um, but he's like, mm, we're not going to talk in front of all these people today. That's totally okay. So one thing that is really different about these parrots versus a um, owl or a raptor is these guys, they have these very big feet, very sharp claws, but they are not called talons. So he has zygodactyl feet. And what that means are those feet allow him to um, use he can only use those feet like a claw machine, essentially. So if you've ever played the arcade game where you're going and trying to get the stuffed animal with the claw, you can't individually move each um, prong of that claw machine. He cannot individually move his toes. He can't only move the back ones or only move the front ones. They're always going in this same motion. So he has two feet in the front, two feet in the back. Very, very dexterous. These guys are able to hang upside down, which is super, super cool. We'll see if Mr. Akira wants to do that today. Akira. Okay. Oh. Wow. <laughs> so as you can see, he can hang on just upside down. He can do this in the trees. Um, it's not uncomfortable for him. This is something that he does in his enclosure on his ropes all the time. And every now and then he likes a big old swing. That's one of the reasons he loves this behavior. Ready, come up. Good boy. Oh. Um, that's why one of the reasons he loves that behavior. I've sat with him as a little kid and just slung him back and forth. He thinks, thinks that's a blast. Um, does anybody have any questions about these guys and their physical adaptions before I talk about conservation for a second? You don't have anything covering your hand. Yes. So with that, these macaws, they don't have talons. So since these animals do not eat, step up. Okay. They do not eat mice, they do not eat rabbits. Those talons are gonna be extremely sharp. So an owl, a red-tailed hawk, any of those um, types of birds, they're going to have um, claws that are meant to rip, tear, shred, and grab. He has long claws, but they're not sharp to the degree, literally almost like a knife, that an owl or a red-tailed hawk might be. <laughs> this is also one of his behaviors. Can you wait? <laughs> okay. He loves to interact with the public. As you know, macaws are extremely social, so he definitely likes to elicit that wave behavior on his own because he loves to see people laugh and really look at him and get their attention. <laughs> so one of the big conservation messages that we talk about with these guys and something that we want you as docents to help communicate to our public is that currently the reason this bird is in jeopardy in the wild is due to the fact that their palm trees are being clear cut for farming. And so it is um, difficult for them to eat, it decreases the dispersal, and they're typically clear cut in order to um, mass produce um, lots of different food products that we might see in our grocery store. Unfortunately, those palm nuts are also used to create something called palm oil, which is found in many, many, many of our different um, food products that we eat, especially candy. Can you step up? They, did, they learned about uh, palm oil and the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo app that hopefully everybody put on their phones. Yes, so you can always communicate to people that, um, you know, if you literally just type in the word palm oil in the app store, that, that first app that pops up, it is a barcode scanner. And as you're going through the grocery store, you can scan all of your um, products that you're buying and it's gonna tell you with a green check mark or a red X, whether or not that product is produced with sustainable palm oil or not. Um, but yeah, this is a curie. They're actually a really nice conservation success story. Um, they were on the brink of extinction almost. They were extremely critically endangered and um, 
people have actually gone out and they've set up, a, I like to call it a conservation camp, um, in the middle of the Amazon rainforest where there are huge nets that run for basically a mile and a mile, and it's completely contained. And these macaws have been um, introduced into the wild, bred there in the wild, and they just think they're in the wild in this very large um, netted enclosure. And then once these macaws are fully grown and able to fend on their own, those nets were eventually taken down and those macaws were released to the wild. So since that conservation project, we have seen their numbers increase to about 7,000 currently in the wild. Um, John, will we see a curate on exhibit? So uh, we are not sure whether we're going to see a curate on exhibit this summer. Many of our ambassador animals do live behind the scenes. Um, and so he is one of those birds that does live behind the scenes a lot of the time. Uh, we do spend a lot of time working on training and working on um, uh, keeping up all of his behaviors. Right now, I will tell you it is March, it is springtime, parrots do go through a large hormone season. He does like Randy very much, so he is over here trying to impress Randy a little bit right now. He wants to, he wants to step up. But... Maybe it's because of the blue shirt. Oh, could be. Yes. Well, he's not flying to the anybody else. Hi, baby. He does. He likes to nestle in my arm. Also, just in case anybody asks from the public, if you look at his left foot over here, he's touching. He does have a band. This band was put on when he was very, very young before he was fully grown, and that is so that way we always know that he is our macaw and we can identify him as an individual. So um, on that band it has his breeder code, who came from a very um, high-tiered uh, conservationist breeder in Florida who works with a lot of very rare and endangered species. So it has that individual's breeder code, has the state that he was hatched in, and, which is FL, and then it also has his individual identification number as well as the year that he was hatched. Um, uh, John, are um, they traded on the illegal pet trade market? They are. So unfortunately, there is a lot of poaching that goes on in the Amazon rainforest as far as parrots for the pet trade. Specifically in um, all of South America, it is very difficult, I'll be honest, to get them into the U.S. And there are so many breeders in the U.S. that um, it's not something we see as much of unless you're on the really southern border um, of the United States. And essentially what happens is individuals will go, they will find a tree that has a nest in it, and they will just pluck chicks straight from the nest um, and then sell them on the pet trade. I will tell you right now, this bird is very quiet, but he can scream up to 120 decibels. Um, and it definitely will make you want to cover your ears when he gets very, very amped up and wants to be a macaw. Um, the reason they get their name the macaw is because when they scream like that, it sounds like someone is screaming macaw um, over and over and over again. So um, does not make a good house pet. Would not ever recommend having parrots in your home as a pet. Um, a curry was hatched in 2017. He is only five years old, and they have the lifespan to be able to live for up to 80 years. Wow. <laughs> He'll be doing presentations about us. <laughs> so before I leave, we're going to ask if anybody has any last questions, and I'll do a short little walk around with the curry so everybody can see him up close. Yeah. <laughs>